All right, blue and white breakdown. I believe it's going to be the final one of 2020. Uh, everyone's favorite year, 2020. I'm Bob Flounders, joined by Greg Pickle. Talking Penn State football here on the Penn Live. Penn State football podcast, Greg. I see that you survived Christmas. I'm sure your wallet's a lot lighter. Uh, we still have a couple days to get through uh, in 2020 before we can get to 2021. But even though Penn State is not playing, uh, I would say a pretty busy final week for James Franklin's Penn State program. First of all, how are you doing? It's another wonderful day in the neighborhood, Bob. Plenty of Penn State news despite no bowl game. Uh, we couldn't be talking about the Duke's Mayo Bowl <laughs> right now. We are not. So there's that. And uh, despite not having a game to cover, there's plenty of transfer portal news to talk about. Yeah, and I think uh, I think Penn State's decision to not play in a bowl game is looking better and better, judging by the a lot of the cancellations, a lot of the last-minute cancellations. Greg, we talked about it. It was a big ask to uh, to uh, get a, a football program that you know largely uh, had been quarantining since June to buckle down for a couple more weeks. Uh, you know, four and five season. They ended on a good note. Um, just uh, and yeah, and you can see, unless it's a huge bowl game, it just seems like a lot can go wrong when you're talking about bowl games. Not very many have been played, but there is. <clears throat> They're going to be a couple with uh, Big Ten teams. The Ohio State Clemson game, we might get a little pick in on that later, Greg. But let's circle back to something James Franklin had said. Uh, you know, they were going to be more aggressive and they were going to target specific, specific positions when it came to the transfer market, better known as the, tr the transfer portal. And I believe Penn State has added at least one, if not two players to the defensive side of the ball so it turns it sounds like so james franklin isn't messing around usually when it gives you some it gives you a hint uh you know there's going to be a lot of truth to it and i know they uh they got a defensive back uh greg from south carolina i, I believe via the transfer portal and you have to wonder if the ties of defensive line coach john scott who came to penn state from south carolina maybe maybe aided in the recruitment or uh the addition of the defensive back yeah, so let's start with Dixon, Bob. He's a guy who Penn State recruited out of high school. Um, he had visited Penn State back during his recruitment, a six-foot, 185-pound corner out of Tampa, Florida. Had really, uh, you know, a quiet freshman year for them, but did play. He had an interception. Uh, then he comes back this year with, I believe, 34 tackles, a handful of pass breakups. Uh, he's a pretty talented guy, and I think this gives Penn State a couple of options. Number one, Assuming three Castro Fields does not come back, which as we talked about this Wednesday at 10 a.m., we still don't have that answer. But let's work under the assumption he does not. Uh, you know, it gives Penn State a little bit more depth at a position where we heard Terry Smith and James Franklin at multiple points this year note that they were playing with like two, two and a half, three corners in some of these games. So anytime you can add to that room, it's going to help. I don't know if he's a guy who comes in and starts right away. But the other thing I'll be curious about is, does Penn State move one of the corners currently at that position to safety? And do they try and manufacture some more out of that position, which is a little light on numbers, uh, with someone who's already a corner? So we'll see. Obviously, they're going to keep looking for safeties in the transfer portal as well. But you're right, Bob. Um, this kind of dates back to when James Franklin predicted Carl Nassib's breakout year. Um, when he's kind of pounded on something repeatedly, you can take it to the bank as it being something Penn State is either going to see happen or make happen. And with the transfer portal, that's certainly been the case so far. They've really uh, sort of spread their wings there, looked for guys. They had 15 signees. There's plenty of room to add guys. So I think when it comes down to what is ahead, uh, it's going to be a quick process. I mean, I hate to say it, but by the time we finish this, upload it, get it out on the site, there could be something new that happens. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not saying there's something brewing on the horizon, but let's not forget there's only about 17 days until Penn State's spring semester starts, and there's a lot of off-field stuff that has to get done for a guy to be ready to enroll by then. So, you know, you can't drag your feet. You can't really 
take forever to make a decision when you're in the transfer portal. It's not like high school recruiting. So expect any more news to become uh, coming out, you know, with sooner rather than later, certainly by the middle of January. Okay. A couple of points. It's Johnny Dixon, right? We, we said Dixon, the, 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 the defensive back thing, Johnny Dixon, Johnny yep. Dixon. That's, That's correct. Yep. Okay. And let's just, let's just get this done. Let's get this done with uh, Tariq Castro fields. A couple of points, you know, he was, I, he, I told, he told me in the off season, he was, you know, he thought a little bit about leaving school after his junior year. He was a third year junior in 2019. He wanted to come back in 20, in 2020 to kind of uh, cement his status as an NFL corner. Uh, you know, and Terry Smith, Penn State's uh, quarterback coach was really high on him saying, if he's healthy, he's going to be one of the better corners in college football. He played a couple of games. He looked good early. <laughs> And then he was essentially a game time decision for like Penn State's last six games would warm up and then would change it for some reason would change into his uh, warm up pants. For, it just didn't make any sense. I'll say this. He was a fourth year senior, Greg. I don't know that I would be holding my breath for an announcement like Will Fries did and Shane Simmons. If you remember last year, Shaka Tony, there was no announcement with Shaka Tony. Some guys, I think they, they, maybe they don't feel the need to make an announcement. I, I still think I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't anything to Tariq Castro fields. I know it's the, it is the kind of the, the way that Penn state would like to do it where they thank fans, but you just can't have every senior just putting these announcements out. I think if he was going to do it, he would have done it already. I don't see any reason why he would come back. My take all along was he was kind of just kind of gearing it down, getting ready for the NFL. He is invited. He got a senior bowl combine invite. Um, like what else are you going to do to get ready for the NFL, but get up, get an invite to the senior bowl. I think it's, what is the, what is it? The word, what's the word fate accompli? I just think, I, I don't know necessarily that we're going to see uh, a specific announcement from Tariq. I think he's gone, but you're right. They are light. They have light at the corner position. Once you get past, you know, Joey Porter Jr., Keaton Ellis, Marquise Wilson. I think they were encouraged by Daquan Hardy as a reserve corner, a nickelback, but they definitely need some more help in that area. Greg, is that did they get are they are they trying to target another kid from the transfer portal? Uh, I thought I saw some stuff on social media. Or are they are they just at one for now, or are they are they looking for a second one? No, there is a second transfer portal addition in defensive tackle, Derek Tangelo. He's from Duke. Duke. Really yeah. productive player down there. He played at the Bullish School, which some might remember mm -hmm. as John Holland's high school, also Dwayne Haskins High School. He's in the news, uh, albeit not because of the transfer <laughs> portal, but something similar to it. At any rate, um, really, really a productive player down there. Two 40-plus tackle seasons. Um, he found his way into the backfield, not a ton, but enough as a defensive tackle kind of took on a lot of different, uh, offensive, uh, you know, assignments and, uh, you know, defense assignments rather that offenses tried to limit him. So didn't find his way necessarily to the backfield a ton did force five fumbles in his career so far. Um, you know, when you lose Antonio Shelton to the transfer portal, even though he probably wasn't going to come back here anyway, but you lose him, you lose Judge, Judge Culpepper, you know, there's not a clear, obvious, um, you know, starter inside there next to PJ Mustafer. I mean, we could right. say Hakeem Beeman, perhaps. Uh, we could say that we've seen Fred Hanser do some nice things. But to me, yeah. Eric Angelo comes in and becomes uh, not to shoe in because he's going to have to earn it. But I, I just can't imagine that he's not the guy that gets the first team reps, assuming there's a spring practice when that is held this year. So I really like this pickup. He visited Penn State as a recruit. Penn State never offered. That was the class of 2017, I believe. Yeah. Uh, 16 or 17, it would have been. And, you know, he's a guy that they kept an eye on, obviously, over the last couple of years. Again, really productive there at Duke. He's a grad transfer, so he'll have, uh, obviously, no restrictions to playing. Let's not forget, though, the NCAA is probably going to pass that free one-time transfer rule for everybody in January, which means Dixon, Johnny Dixon would be eligible too. John Lovett, of course, the other guy, the running back from Baylor who transferred in last week, he is a grad transfer and immediately eligible. And Bob, we got a question the other day and we need to look into it. I think this is the case though. With everyone getting a free year of eligibility, I do believe these guys would be eligible for two seasons potentially the grad transfers, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Regardless, I, I don't really see, like we've talked about before, 
five, six, seven years is a long time to play college football. I don't think you're going to see too many guys go in the Antonio Shelton route and seeking a sixth year. So we'll see. But uh, yeah, I like Tangelo a lot. Obviously, we've seen Penn State add guys through the portal before. They've never added three guys with this much college production, obviously. And they're not done yet. There's other names out there. Everyone wants us to talk about what they're going to do at quarterback. Uh, You know, we'll see how things shake out there. But all all told, Bob, it's a really good start to their hunt through the portal. And it's going to be something that I think you're going to hear college coaches complain about endlessly, having to recruit their own guys, having to worry about transfers and fine transfers. But it, it just is what it is. You have to do it. And Penn State's done a good job so far. Yeah, real quick. Do you understand why Shelton decided to play a sixth year of college football and do it at some place other than Penn State? Um, that's a lot of football to play for a nose tackle. I thought he had a pretty solid year. He's not a flashy player who's going to have a lot of stats. So I just and that one really caught me by surprise. I thought for sure he was going to maybe take his chances in some way, shape, or form, uh, either with the NFL draft, NFL as a free agent. But for him to come back. Uh, to play college football. That really surprised me. Do you do you see the logic there, Greg? Not really. No, that was one I'm still trying to put my finger on. And he wrote a very nice note to Penn yeah. State, but then said at the end that he felt like to better himself, he had to move on to somewhere else, which it didn't really jive with the whole, the first four or five paragraphs of his note. So, yeah, I'm not sure, Bob. That one did certainly catch me off guard. I didn't see that coming. Uh, obviously, you know, there's been some – Big 10 schools, I think, that have shown some interest in him. We'll see. Um, Productive player at times at Penn State. Other times he was somewhat unnoticeable, even as a starter. And, uh, you know, but always a good interview. Always was good to us when we got to talk to him. So I wish him well. But, yeah, I don't quite follow the thought process there at this point. I also enjoyed uh, late in the season his uh, celebration dances. I don't know if the fan base got to see that. Is he he from the Midwest? What, What part of the Midwest is he from, Greg? Westerville, Ohio. So you just wonder if he's going to try and play somewhere closer to home. I hate to say, but when you think of Ohio and college football, there's really only one team that comes to mind. I don't know either. Wish him the best, though. Uh, you could just tell he was a very well-liked by, uh, player by his teammates and the coaching staff, a true team leader, um, a valuable player when it came to run defense. When Penn State had a very good run defense in 2019, they got better at it as the season went on. But, yeah, that one – that one did surprise me, Greg, but hey, um, it sounds like he has a plan in mind. So uh, hopefully he stays healthy and hopefully uh, the Penn State fan base will follow him uh, if they get a chance. Greg, let's uh, let's pivot to let's pivot to a little bit of recruiting news, if that's OK with the fan base. Um, there is a, a pretty, pretty talented uh, Penn State high school player that has been on Penn State's radar uh, for a while, you and I are familiar with him because he's a Harrisburg area player. Makai Flowers, Steel High, uh, the PIAA champion Steel High Rollers. Uh, he did it all for that program. Penn State's got some ties uh, to Steel High. Troy Drayton, the tight end from the 90s, very good tight end who played in the NFL, uh, played at Steel High. Jordan Hill, uh, the nose tackle for Penn State for Bill O'Brien's. Penn State teams and some of the late Joe Paterno's uh, Penn State teams, very productive player at Penn State who also played in the NFL, is a steel high guy. I'm sure I'm missing a couple players, but uh, there's a little bit of a tradition there. Greg, how do you see Makai Flowers' uh, announcement? Uh, I believe it's to be later this week. We're doing this on a Wednesday morning. It's to be in a couple of days. How do you see it playing out? How solid uh, of a favorite is Penn State maybe to land this very unique player? Yeah, I I like him a lot, Bob. He had over a 1,000 receiving yards as a uh, member of the Rollers. Obviously, you mentioned they won a state title in his junior season. They'll be probably favored to win one again in his senior year uh, in 2021. So we're talking about this on Wednesday, December 30. He's going to announce his choice on January 1st. He has not, as of this recording, put a timeout for when that's going to be. I'll go ahead and guess midday, but we'll see. Um, you know, uh, he has a top 10 list, and uh, to me, Penn State obviously sticks out like a sore thumb as one of the school or the school that would be the leader uh, of the pack. You know, the 247 Sports Crystal Ball is unanimous, so is the Rivals cast pick. So have a hard time seeing him picking anyone but the Nittany Lions on Friday. If that turns out to be the case, that will give them three four-star receivers 
in that class in Caden Saunders, who's from Ohio, and of course the Mannheim Central standout Anthony Ivy, uh, who's committed in this cycle as well. So that would give Penn State eight class of 2022 commits. It's already a top five, top three class in the nation and in the Big Ten. This would only solidify that. And, you know, Taylor Stubblefield was brought to Penn State to, number one, as James Franklin said, provide some stability to that room after they had some pretty uh, good turnover there the you know, last few years. But then also to really mold uh, Penn State's receivers in the way that he played. And obviously he had a tremendous playing career at Purdue. And if they sign, if they get Flowers, and assuming that they go a whole year and sign uh, Sounders, Flowers, and Ivy, I mean – the last three recruiting classes are just chock full of receiver talent. I mean, everyone saw Parker Washington and Keandre Lambert Smith this year. Malik Mega and Jaden Dotton are still waiting in the wings. Liam Clifford, uh, Lonnie White Jr., and Harrison Wallace just signed to that position. And now they have three, uh, two uh, four stars on board and potentially a third if Flowers does end up picking state on Friday. So, uh, that room will not be hurting for talent and it'll be up to Stubblefield for as long as he's at Penn State to get the most out of it. Yeah, so we'll keep our uh, our ears to the railroad tracks. I think that's the saying with um, Flowers. It sounds like uh, the Penn State uh, program feels pretty good about their choices, their chances uh, with Makai Flowers. Always good to see a local kid. I think Greg go to Penn State. Uh, let's let's backtrack to one thing I forgot. Um, so Greg, now there was no, I guess not a big surprise um, that Jason Alway uh, opted to get ready for the NFL draft after his red shirt sophomore year at Penn state, really his, it was his only year as a starter. Uh, he didn't play the last couple of games. I think he suffered an upper body injury in the Rutgers win. Um, fantastic, fantastic athlete tests off the charts. One of those guys that if he goes to the combine, he's going to win it uh, more so even than Mike Gesicki did a couple of years ago. Um, you know, he, but he, he is a young player that's still trying to figure it out. He was, a, I believe, a first team all Big Ten defensive end. Uh, so Penn State didn't have him for a very long time. Uh, Shaka Tony also made it official. He won't be back for his sixth year, nor should he have been back for his sixth year. Another productive player. Um, but you combine those two with Shane Simmons. So, Greg, you know, in 2021, you know, I'm I'm thinking Penn State's defensive end group will feet will be led by Adisa Isaac, um, still an unproven player. He's one starter, but who's going to be the other starter for Penn State? And was, were you surprised at all that Jason decided to move on? There's still some people that think he could go in the first round. Yeah, no, not really. I mean, obviously, I think. A lot of people will point to some of his numbers from this season and say that use that as a basis of an argument that he's not ready. Uh, I just I think the I really, truly believe that he did more uh, things this year that didn't show up on the stat yeah. sheet than he did last year. There's I, I just I, there's no other conclusion for me to draw after watching every game this year. So, yeah, I think he was ready. I think this was a no brainer if they have the combine, which we assume they will in some way, shape or form. He's going to test off the charts. Someone's going to fall in love with his freakish athleticism. Yeah. He still can probably put some weight on if he wanted to. So, no, I wasn't surprised by that at all, Bob. And, you know, truthfully, uh, you know, guys, I think anymore, as long as they get the kind of feedback they're looking for in the portal, they're just going to go ahead. I'm sorry, in the portal, yeah. In the uh, draft evaluation process, they're just going to go. If they are getting the right kind of feedback, we know James Franklin is very honest with these guys and gives them a full report of what to expect what they can have as an outlook for the next level. So, you know, I, I would just say that uh, this is not a surprise. This was expected. And really the only shocker of it all was at how long it took after the season ended for that word to come out. Um, so as for who starts at defensive end, they got to be active in the portal there too. They really do. And there's a kid from Temple, uh, Arnold Ebiketti, Eb perhaps is how he pronounces it. I'm not 100%. Sure, let's go with that, sure. Yeah. What's up? I said, sure, let's go with that pronunciation. I, I trust you. Uh, it's close, I hope. Um, second team, all AAC pick this year. Kind of had a breakout year for them. He's one to keep an eye on uh, at defensive end in the portal. You know, I think that uh, they have to add somebody there because they have some talent at that position, Bob, but when it's not proven talent. And I think you would just like to have somebody with a, a veteran college football 
uh, background and experience to come in and and at least be part of that room, if not a starter opposite Adisa Isaac. So we'll see how that plays out. Speaking of NFL draft announcements, Bob, um, I kind of ruined things for us last week when I predicted that there would be uh, – when I said that there had not been a lot of news yet on the Penn State front, and then we got plenty. So I will do that again here and note right. that as we talk, it's 1024 on Wednesday, December 30. Still no reward from Jahan Dotson. Uh, I'm starting to wonder if maybe that means he's going to stick around. And he's the kind of guy that could end up going that Shaka Tony route, Bob, where he just doesn't say anything and then spring practice and whoop, there he is. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I would say the longer it goes, probably the better Penn State's chances of him uh, coming back. It was never a done deal. We, my, my point was I just don't know how much bigger he's going to get. And I just don't know how much more productive he could be at Penn state this than he was this past year. You, I think you saw a lot of the best of Jahan Dotson in terms of, you know, he, he's a guy you can trust. He's a guy that can make contested catches. He's a guy that's got very good speed. He can make the plays after the catch. He doesn't drop a lot of passes. You can use him in the return game. I mean, um, but yeah, he's got some time still to, to think about it. But I would say this, you know, the, you're also starting to see a lot of talented receivers declare for the draft. I think Florida's, two of Florida's very best receivers uh, just announced they were going to skip the bowl game uh, that they're playing in. I think they're playing in it today as we tape this. I think it's the Cotton Bowl. They're going to blow off the Cotton Bowl to get ready for the draft. There's going to be a lot of talented receivers in the draft. And the more talented receivers in the draft, you know, the greater the odds that maybe Jahan uh, slips a little bit. Uh, I think a lot of people think that he might be a better overall receiver than K.J. Handler, maybe not the game breaker that K.J. Handler is. But the downside, if there is one with K.J. Handler, is he dropped a lot of passes at Penn State. He's a very, very undersized receiver. He dealt with some injuries uh, in his first year with Denver. But, Greg, I was thinking about the same thing. I, I think that um, – I, I would I feel like if you, you're if you're going to hear something from Jahan, it would probably be in the next week in terms of a statement. But you're right. I think I think Shaka Tony broke the mold when he had no announcement at all. That is also he could just do that and say, yeah, well, I didn't owe you guys an explanation. I was always planning on coming back. I don't see the need for a big announcement. I mean, Jahan Dotson is is, a, is kind of a quiet guy, much like Shaka Tony. That could be. That could be his plan all along. I'll tell you what, though, with all these defensive defections, uh, Penn State's losing up front. You know, they're probably going to, I mean, they're, they're going to lose Brisker, I think, at Tariq Castro Fields on the back end for sure. This offense is probably going to have to carry them for however far they go in 2021. So if they can have Parker Washington and Jahan Dotson leading a wideout room, they got the two young tight ends in Bretton Strange. Uh, and Theo Johnson, who knows what Zach Koontz can contribute. They should have, by my count, you know, I don't see, I, you know, they're going to lose Will Fries. They, they, we still have to decide what, I wonder about Rasheed Walker still. I still think he's, he's considering uh, his future as well, but they're going to return, you know, Cade Wallace. I think Mike Miranda is going to come back. The, I thought the, de uh, the development of Juice Scruggs was a sneaky positive thing for Penn State this year, Greg. They played him a lot, um, you know, in a reserve role, but he played a lot of football. I think he could play center or both guard spots. I think they're very high on him. You still have to wonder if maybe they're, they could get C.J. Thorpe healthy and focused and motivated. I think he is a, he is a starting uh, Big Ten guard when he's right. I think he showed flashes of being a very good player. I mean, I think the offensive line could be pretty good, even though they got to replace Michael Mennett. Um, for sure, and also Will Fry. But the offense is going to have to really be, I think, uh, the strength of the team in 2021 because I just don't see a lot <laughs> on the defensive side. Once you get past a couple of young corners and the promise of Brandon Smith at linebacker, there's still a lot of question marks, Greg. So I don't know, but I think your point about Jahan Dotson is a good one. I was starting to think that myself. I've been watching to see how many quality wideouts are going to be available in the draft and the more quality wideouts in the draft maybe the, the greater the chance that somebody like Jahan Dotson will come back and you still there's still some really good teams whose receivers are playing in meaningful bowl games in those semifinals 
that I think also could go to the NFL as well. But it's worth keeping an eye on uh, for sure. We're we're way more than halfway through uh, the blue white breakdown, the final blue white breakdown of 2020. We did a lot of these, Greg. I'm kind of proud of it. Um, why don't you tell the uh, the audience what they can do, where they can find us, how they can get us a day early, and what to expect? Also, have we have we laid out a plan of blue white breakdown podcasts maybe for the month of January? Yeah. So the blue white breakdown completing its first year. It was a fun one, Bob. Uh, moving into the off season, you can still find it the same place: Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your Stitcher, wherever you get your podcast audio. And the Blue White Breakdown video, of course, is available on YouTube.com slash All Penn State. Got to shout out our buddy Mark Pines for producing that for us all year mm-hmm. long. Joe Hermit pinch hitting every now and again as well. Uh, t- January, I-, I think we're looking at probably two podcasts a week, Bob. You and me doing one and you and Dave Jones doing one. That's yeah. the plan at the moment. We'll see. It'll be some variation of that. Uh, we'll get those cranked up. Uh, starting, uh, I guess, next week because we're about to 2021, mercifully. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> Obviously, there's going to be, you know, like we said, plenty to discuss, not just with uh, potential new 2021 recruits coming on to the yeah. board, but transfer portal guys, additions and subtractions. You know, I guess let me ask you this, and this is kind of a trying to spin it ahead to January a little bit, but gut feeling right now. We are, what, a week and three days removed from Penn State's last game? No movement on the coaching staff from surprising, not Uh, surprising. uh And what do you think that means for the future? I know we had talked before and said that if there was going to be some change, perhaps it'd be on the defensive side of the ball. Here's the thing. It it, it feels like it's if anything was going to happen, it should have by now because Penn State's not in a bowl game. But let's not forget that if they were in a bowl game, it would be today. You know, I think that – there's probably still some evaluation stuff going on, and we'll see. But where are you at on that right now? Got yeah, not surprised. I think that the, <clears throat> I think the coaching staff. I don't know. I don't know how the quarantine went, but I think there were a lot of coaches maybe that wanted to go home get to get to see their families, their kids, their wives, all their significant others. I'm sure James Franklin is doing that as we speak. I know they have other duties as well, but I think I think you're going to see this if there's going to be any moves. I think it'll still be. A little while yet y'all you also wonder about the financial impact that it would it would take maybe to make a couple of these moves in terms of i don't know what the contract status is of, of a lot of these assistants uh we're going to keep our eye on the defensive side of the ball if there's going to be any move but i just can't see i don't know why they would james would make any changes on the offensive side that he would initiate um he, he just hired an offensive line coach and a wide receivers coach i thought you know Their position groups play pretty well. uh, Looking at the whole of the season, he's got a he's got a brand spanking new offensive coordinator. I don't obviously I don't see any movement there. You always wonder about a guy like Jawan Sider just because um, of what he can do as a recruiter as well as developing running backs. I think he's always going to be a coveted guy. So you know if they would lose him, I don't know. I obviously I don't think James wants to lose him, but he there is a guy on the offensive side that maybe other programs might target it might be him but I do think you probably I mean it's it's December 30th now so we're pretty much locked into if it's going to be any movement uh it would be it would be late in the year and there's been some late moves I remember if you remember the 2017 season um we didn't learn until after the out the the uh, Alabama uh national championship game win over Georgia I believe it was I think a day or two later I think Josh Gaddis was out the door on his way to the Crimson Tide. So you just don't know. I, I, I like I said, for, for him, for the entire staff to remain intact, that to me, that would be a surprise when you're four and five. You can say you can get excited about the four game win streak, but you also got to talk about the five game losing streak. Um, they definitely shouldn't. They definitely weren't a four win t- team on paper, pandemic or no pandemic. And there's no getting around that. So we'll we'll see. Greg, there was a there was a couple things I wanted to get to you real quick before we wrap up the blue white podcast i successfully on two separate uh blue white breakdowns did a dave jones flip-flop on the ohio state northwestern game when i talked to you i said you're crazy not to take northwestern in the 20 and then i talked to dave and i stupidly uh said well ohio state's going to try and impress the people who put together the playoff turns out 
Had it not been, we're talking a lot about grad transfers, uh, Greg. Had it not been for one Ohio State grad transfer, grad transfer, and it wasn't Justin Fields, they wouldn't be in the playoffs. Trey Sermon <laughs> ran for like 700 yards against Northwestern, and they needed every one of them to beat the Wildcats in a very, very lackluster effort by a, a shorthanded Ohio State team. But hey, they're in the semifinals. They got Dabo and Clemson. Uh, up on Friday, Dabo's not shy about what he thinks of Ohio State's season, ranking them 11th <laughs> on his ballot. Uh, and obviously, Alabama, huge favorite over Notre Dame. Does anything jump out to you uh, e- in either semifinal, whether whether it's point spreads or a strong feeling? And I guess we're, we can I, I guess we can afford to wait to give our national championship game predictions, but. How do you look at the semifinals? Obviously, you think Alabama is going to beat Notre Dame. The question is, is Alabama going to cover against Notre Dame? They're a great offense, but they give up a lot of points. And also, what do you make of this Clemson-Ohio State rematch from last year's semifinal, which is one, which was really a great game? Yeah, no doubt about it, Bob. You know, I look at Alabama-Notre Dame, and I, I just don't see how the Fighting Irish are going to be able to keep pace with – Alabama I don't I mean that offense is just so efficient and so smooth and I know the defense can have some issues they let Florida Florida get back inside a couple different numbers if you're talking about the point spread as you might recall from our trip home (laughs) Um, but yeah so you know I think that obviously that they have some works defensively there's no doubt but I I don't know if Ian Book and company can do what Kyle Trask and Kyle Pitts and some of those other guys down there did so I mean Notre Dame might keep pace for a little bit but uh, I think Alabama wins it's a huge point spread I think at last check it was 19 and a half yeah that's big which I don't love laying that in a college football playoff semifinal but we've also seen Brian Kelly's teams not exactly show up at times for the biggest games of the season so I will lay the points with Alabama uh maybe a little sounds like a teaser to me smells like a teaser little first half interest as well um get out to a hot start so I'm going there, and then Bob, I'll take the points with Ohio State. Uh, I you know I don't think they win that game, but uh, I you know, and obviously you make a good point. They're going to have to get Sermon going sooner rather than later. I do think that the fact that they had a number of guys, I know they weren't all starters, but I, it sounded like that lead up to the Big Ten title game was an absolute mess in Columbus. Assuming that's not the case this year, which I'll get on my soapbox some other time about college football and the need for some kind of availability report that comes out sooner than kickoff. Um, but <laughs> a, different topic for a different day, but you know, yeah. assuming there is as full strength as expected, I think they can keep this game close. You know, the thing with Dabo is, you know, I think. I saw that in like September or so, he had said that he would have no issue with the Big Ten team playing in the college football playoff because they earned if they earned it. Uh, clearly, he doesn't think they should be able to play six games and still earn that spot. We'll see. Uh, you know, Gar- uh, Trevor Lawrence against Justin Fields is going to be fascinating. So I'll take the points there. What is it? Seven, seven and a half, something like that. Half. That half point looms large as we talk about the uh, the backdoor cover. I think the big key for me is the, how healthy is Justin Fields. Um, I think he hurt his thumb early in that Northwestern uh, game, and I think that really impacted them the, the, their ability uh, to be, you know, a balanced offense. I also don't think they had Chris Olave, the wideout, against Northwestern. He should be back, but I think you're going to know early <clears throat> in the Clemson game if Fields is healthy enough to be the Justin Fields. Uh, we saw against Penn State. He had some. He had uh, a couple uh, games though where he threw a lot of interceptions. The Northwestern game being one, the Indiana game being another. Um, that half point is everything, though. Right? You're right, Greg. I think uh, if I had to, I would probably take Ohio State in the points. I think you will see. <clears throat> I, I think that maybe the to- the total in that game is something I would take a look at. I'm not sure what it is, but. I kind of have to feel like that is the game that's going to be that game. That game is in the sugar it's in New Orleans. Correct. So that'll be the weather will not impact that game at all. It'll just be indoors, fast track, all that stuff. Correct. Yes. That's how I see it as well. So we'll see. Hopefully two good games, four o'clock and eight o'clock on ESPN. I believe it's Alabama, Notre Dame first and then Clemson, Ohio State second. Yeah. 
All right. Well, I'm sure the Penn State fan base will be watching with uh, with uh, renewed interest. Uh, there's still football to be played, so we're going to watch it. Happy uh, New Year, everyone. Stay safe. <laughs> let's get let's get the hell out of 2020 in one piece and take our chances in 2021 because I don't think there's anywhere to go. Knock on wood. But up. So we'll see you guys in the new year.